All right, Jeremy. Hey, how's it going? Give me a second. Just turning up the volume. Can you say something? I see the gym. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you don't see me yet. <laughs> All right, let me turn off. Uh, yeah, I see you now. Change the virtual background to something else. No, it's okay. okay. Is it still busy? <laughs> Good. Is there Robin? <clears throat> hey, Robin. Hey, Dan. Hi, Jeremy. What's going on, Robin? Good to see you. Hey, Dan, can you make me co-host just in case I need to do the screen share? Or do okay. I need to co-host? Maybe I don't need screen to. Share. Anyway. Oh, I can? Let me try. Yeah, you can see my screen? Yeah. Okay, cool. Stopping. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So you have the video link in your screen or how do you wanna? Nah, I'm not gonna show the video. I just thought I just kind of talk about um, just saying, you know, happy to be a sponsor. Uh, and then I'm gonna just tell a quick story of why, you know, WP exists, you know, I'll talk about how I sold my digital marketing agency and then realized that what I really like to do is really help smaller businesses. So I felt like this was kind of a, a void that was kind of missing. So that's what I'm doing, what I'm doing. Okay. So I figured just put a human element to the sponsorship, right? Versus just kind yeah, of, yeah. Um, hey, yeah, this is buy from us. You know what I mean? I, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Robin, anything else to add before we start in a few minutes? No, I just thought I would uh, be here a few minutes already just to check in. Uh, I noticed that you guys, um, uh, in the email thread that Alex had sent through. And um, yeah. anyway, that seems to be in hand. So, uh, you know, we're good to go. Uh, I do have to leave around 7, um, 7, 10, 7, 05, around there. So I'm only going to be here for maybe like half an hour to 40 minutes. Yeah, no problem. Robin, I made you co-host. Uh, doesn't, you know, just in case I have to leave or do something sure. or be out of my uh, computer. So just so you know. Are you <clears throat> using a webcam that's on your a notebook or laptop? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Because I just, you know, it's it's looking up at you, as opposed to straight on. I'm a little bit over illuminated here. Let me turn some lights down. There, that should be better. Ah, not quite so bright. <laughs> yeah, the laptop is on the table. Maybe. I I can put a book under it. Maybe this will help.
I must say the uh, <clears throat> cameras on modern phones, like the iPhones, they're remarkably good. I mean, I've got a, I've had in over the years, several very sophisticated, you know, single lens reflex cameras. But, to, you know, to get in a phone, one that's just as good as any of them for most things, it's quite remarkable. <laughs> yeah, and they don't have the glass, but they have lots of computing power. Yeah. Right. Well, and in fact, I guess lenses aren't quite as important as we thought um, because lenses are what you spend a lot of money on in the old style and analog cameras. Anyway, I see a message here that there are five people in the waiting room. Yeah, I think I'll open the waiting room. And I mean, there's no reason not to get underway. Yeah. I think. I see that I have recording and pause buttons as well. Uh, yeah, it's recording. So you're recording? Do me a favor, and just as a backup, because I'll do it as well. Um, you have to you have to copy and capture the chat transcript um, as a text file. Uh, it, I don't think it's saved anywhere. Um, and so I just select the whole thing and, you know, copy and mm -hmm. paste it into a text file as my sort of standard operating procedure. But... Um, sometimes I use this um, uh, front end for Zoom called um, Circle, which adds some better capabilities for breaking up the windows that Zoom has and organizing them differently. Um, but it doesn't have the ability to copy from the chat window. Right. Yeah. So I'll... Uh... There's an option to export the chat, I think. Is there? Where's that? If you open the chat window. Yeah. Maybe now there's, there isn't because there's nothing in the chat, but there's an option to save chat. Uh, participation chat. Usually when I record, it always has like a, like a .txt file. Right. It exports the chat as well. Yeah, but there's nothing in the chat window. Yeah, there's, um, there's three dots there. Yeah, but that's for directing the conversation. No, no, you see on the top one. Oh, right. Okay, so it says it's grayed out because there isn't any chat. Right. All right. Thank you. I think this reactions thing uh, button is new, isn't it? Or re relatively recent? Or have I just not noticed it? Uh, no, it's been there for a while. And what about the security button on the far side? Um, I think so too. You yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Actually, yeah, I see. Yeah, I think we'll wait a few more minutes since we have 40 RSVPs and 10 people. I've been and using I lately an online video editor um, rather than use iMovie, which is free on the Mac, but it's a gargantuan application. And if all you want to do is just trim a video, it's like massive overkill. Anyway, what I'll do is I'll cut out this front part of the video. Yeah. Uh, a chance and then that way it'll start up when the actual session starts up for real uh does the zoom account have cloud recording i feel like if you pay for the pro version you should have cloud recording on zoom cloud you, you mean can storage actually... in the cloud yeah 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 I, th I think there is dan i don't know whose account it is but then if you log in there uh if you record it to the cloud you can do trimming right on the cloud okay because when Alex has done that before. He hasn't mentioned anything about it. He's been doing the recording part up to now. Yeah, I don't know if this is a pay the premium. I mean, it, it is up to a hundred participants, but uh, I think either. It's I think it's paid if there's if there are multiple. Wait a second. Yeah, if it's more than forty minutes, it has to be a premium account. Right. So this must be a premium account. I, I thought 
Alex changed it a couple of months ago from using his own business account to this to a separate one. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm not sure who's the admin admin of the account. Well, I think the way it's set up is that the account thinks there's just one person, uh, organizers, etc. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not individual to us. So licensed account up to 100 participants. Yeah, we do webinars sometimes. So then uh, I have licensed that it's up to 500. Mm -hmm. You guys need. I don't think. I think 100 is our current envelope. Okay, I'll stay with the waiting room so everyone can come in while they're coming in. Okay, I think we'll, uh, we'll start. We'll thank those who came on time and not wait anymore. Whoever will come, will come. Uh, my name is Dan and uh, I'm uh, co-hosting this WordPress meetup uh, together with Robert and Alex who is not here today. Uh, we've been doing this meetup for, uh, for a few years and a couple of years ago, we kind of shifted towards uh, Fix My Site uh, and do the meetup in order to help people with WordPress issues, small and big problems, uh, helping them sometimes solve it during the meetup, sometimes uh, just you know, show them the right direction into the way to solve uh, their their issues. Uh, the way we're uh, doing it is through our meetup page. Uh, you would write uh, Hi. request okay. comment, uh, and then uh, in the order of the request, we would uh, help us solve uh, uh, the issue. Um, what we ask is uh, that once uh, you're ready to talk, you have your website ready, either the front end and or uh, the back end, so we can take a look. Um, this uh, meetup has uh, been sponsored by uh, two uh, organizations. The first one is uh, Weglot. Um, Weglot is a, is a company based off of France, which take care of uh, uh, website translation. So you probably have heard of um, WPML, Polylang, these uh, plugins for uh, WordPress to translate. What Weglot does, and I'll share my screen so uh, we, can, we can actually see their website so you can uh, know what we're talking about. Right, this, this is their company. What they do actually is they 
their idea is to move all the translation into the cloud. So all you do is install the plugin in your site, set up the languages you want, and they scan your site on their uh, computers and they throw back the, the translated language. So all the calculation, all the work is done on their end. And it's a software, software as a service um, uh, programs, meaning while you're paying for it, you get it. It's not like a one-time pay or uh, an installment of a, of a plugin, uh, which can really uh, lower the amount of in, uh, involvement in, in the website. Uh, so it's a pretty cool plugin. Uh, our second sponsor is uh, Double P Up, and we're very happy to have uh, Jeremy Choi here uh, in our meetup, and he can say a few words about uh, that will be up and how he can help websites. So Jeremy, uh, screen is yours. Hey, hey, thanks, Dan. Hey, how are you guys? I thought I'd just kind of uh, share the site so you guys can see it. But yeah, just uh, happy to be a sponsor for WP Up. Uh, so WP Toronto, I've been a member for Word, uh, of WordPress Toronto for maybe about five years now. Uh, I was actually on the committee with Alex, Dan, and Robin for multiple word camps in Toronto. Uh, so if it's okay with you, I'd just like to share, you know, a quick story of why we exist instead of telling you what we do. Um, before I sold my digital marketing agency, I had about uh, 25 employees managing over 50 clients. And what I've noticed is that many small businesses uh, require very small changes. Usually that only takes about 15 to 30 minutes um, max. But then you'll have to kind of go through layers like account managers, approvals, quotations. And by the time it gets done, it's a week later and you know people get slapped with a $250 bill from the agency. So after selling my agency, this is what I knew was kind of missing for small businesses and the ability to be able to... Um, uh, almost have a web agency by your side at a fraction of the price. So there's no account managers, just straight engineers, um, ready on standby to help your kind of WordPress needs. Um, this gave me a bit more satisfaction because I felt, uh, and I knew we were making a positive um, difference in their business, in your business. So I'm looking forward to being part of the meetup, uh, give back and support as you know, as, as much as possible. I told Dan and Alex that I'll be putting together some draw prizes for every three months, also providing um, any of the uh, meetup uh, members that attend, the, um, I guess, the, the meetup, individual one-time 25% uh, off lifetime coupons if they're interested in our services and stuff. So that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Jeremy. So, uh guests and participants of this meetup, stay tuned and uh, you might win a prize from uh, WP Up. All right, so now uh, that we got the housekeeping out of the way, we can uh, actually start the meetup and start fixing uh, websites. I'll move over to, this is our meetup page, which uh, <coughs> all of you have RSVP. And if we take a look here down here, to the comment section uh, where you uh, post your requests. So right now we don't have too many requests. So what we will do, we'll start uh, looking at if we need help. And if uh, we're done with that, we can have a open discussion or you can uh, raise your issues even though you haven't uh, uh, commented here. Uh, so uh, Mary, is Mary here? No. Is uh, Mai here? Mai had an issue previously with her website. I just thought it would be to mention um, when you have when you have uh, posts and pages on a website and you want to share on social media, if it's on Facebook or uh, Twitter, um, usually what the website does, either through the theme or a plugin, it adds the OG tags. OG tags are open graph tags, which they essentially tell social media what to show, what you represent when you share a post. The image, the, the title, the description, all those are OG tags. OG stands for open graph. And they're, uh, they're used by, uh, by Twitter, by Facebook, by the other uh, social medias. And what my uh, issues, issue was, 
that she just, whenever she shared, she would just uh, see not the title, but it would say, place your title here. So what we did is, what my, my uh, recommendation to her was to go into a tool, uh, Facebook tool, which is called the Facebook debugger. What that does, Facebook, you can request Facebook to, to scrape your site, to look into your site and fetch back uh, uh, those uh, the titles and the, and the featured images. And also what ended up, uh, so that's the first tool that, that uh, she did. And the second thing that she did, which essentially uh, that uh, solved her issue, was that there were actually two uh, plugins working on her site, which uh, uh, collided into one another and, and didn't allow this to happen. So as part of her theme, she had a open graph tool and also Yoast SEO, which is a SEO plugin, had, had it uh, it's uh, um, open graph tool. So once she disabled, disabled her, her themes, Yoast uh, uh, kicked in and then uh, that worked. So that's another thing to remember, um, specifically for this case, not to have more than one plugin doing the, same, the job, but also in general, when you have a website and since it's so easy to get plugins, you know, they're free, they're everywhere. Uh, just one click of a button, you can you know abuse your website with hundreds of plugins. You have to check that usually you would have one plugin per feature. So if you have a contact form, you don't need three contact form plugins. Uh, if you have a slider, you don't need three slider plugins. What that usually does in a good case scenario, it doesn't hurt uh, your display of the site, but it can it can be a, a security vulnerability for <clears throat> one of the plugins. It could be uh, um, you, you would need to update them. And in the worst case scenario, like what happened to mine, that they actually interfere with one another. So a good thing to do is, you know, when, when, during the meetup or when the meetup's over, log into your site, uh, check that you don't have too many plugins that are doing the same thing. And then whichever plugin you just had and installed like a few months ago and you didn't use, it's best practice to remove. Of course, after you check that it's not actually uh, tied into any functionality in your website. So that's, uh, that's about that issue. And uh, I might just add that um, in addition to open graph as a method of providing metadata to search engines, there is another whole scheme which isn't focused specifically on uh, social media, but rather on sort of industries across the board uh, is uh, schema.org, uh, just the way it sounds. Uh, that happens to be the site where the scheme is set out. Um, and there are a variety of plugins in the repository to assist you to use schema.org metadata. Uh, and then there's another beast called Dublin Core, which predates all of this stuff by at least 10 years. But you might run across it when you have to be looking at somebody's site and you wonder what these DC meta tags are because they look awfully similar to the OG tags. And in fact, Open Graph to a certain extent, you know, is a um, successor uh, scheme to the two that I've mentioned. Um, and then what was the other point? Yeah, the, the point that you make, Dan, about uh, several plugins with similar capabilities or the same capabilities, which if you're not careful, you'll end up using both or several plugins to accomplish the same thing and result with the result that nothing gets done as you plan. <clears throat> I happen to be working on something today that involved um, redirection. And I hadn't been, I mean, and I'm familiar with the fact that redirection as a rule occurs in um, a file referred to as HT access, which is pretty much standard for web servers, at least Apache ones. Um, but I wasn't aware that there in cPanel, in at least the, the current version that I was, that I work with, um, you can do redirection directly for the site without the use of a plugin at all. And my first thought was, I wonder if when you set up a redirection in a plugin, as well as using cPanel, um, 
do they conflict or are they just additional things written to that HD access file? The answer is not as important as just the fact that oftentimes it turns out that there may be a, a command line or, or command technique as well as a plugin or some other method in the hosting admin software. So uh, just to be on alert for that, and if you happen to see something that looks like an alternate way to do something, it's just to take into account that you may have to choose, it may be better to choose between them than to try to use both, uh, especially in a case like the one I described where <laughs> making a mess of your HD access file will basically close your site down in an eye blink. Um, it's as vital as anything there is in terms of any website. Yeah, uh, and, you know, there are so many strings and levers to pull when you uh, manage your website. I mean, you, you, you would have the files, you have the WP admin, you have uh, the server level, which you said on cPanel. So, you know, you might, uh, like in your case, think, you know, okay, uh, let's do a redirect. And you do it through a plugin on WordPress. And then uh, you can also do it through cPanel. And then half a year later, you don't remember where you did it. And you think you did it just on a plugin and you change it or disable it, but the, the redirect is still going on. So, you, you know, the, the, the method will probably be, first of all, documenting, and then maybe, maybe deciding, okay, if I'm gonna do redirects, I'm gonna do it just in one, uh, uh, in one method, either on the cPanel or on a with a plugin. And that way you cut down their, your options for getting lost with all these uh, rules and changes that you do. Uh, on your website, either it's redirect or other options that you, you have both in CPAN and, all, and on a plugin level. Okay, so uh, we have Fern. Is Fern here? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Yes. Hi, Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good to see you. Uh, you wrote about, uh, talk about sharing articles on blog with my commentary in addition. Yeah. Okay, about well, the New York's combination with SEM Rush. So, yeah, elaborate okay. on that. well, they're both just very fast things. Um, I'm, I'm not really using my website for this, but just, um, just wanted you to show me. Um, it just came out this Yoast just came out with they're now aligned with SEMrush to help you with um, um, keyword search, things like that, which everyone needs today because otherwise their websites aren't going to be seen. <laughs> It's, it's half the battle. But so I just wondered if you could show us an example, show us Yoast where just, um, there's a method, I, I started watching this tutorial, there's a method, it's kind of new, maybe none of you have seen it yet. I think it just came out. Um, how, how you use it, just how do you use um, Yoast? Or do, you have, do you have the URL for what you were, the resource you, you were referring to? You just go to someone's website and go to Yoast. Um, it, it, it's in the, it's in the, uh, it's in the, um, under posts in, in Yoast in the section that says posting or something. It's the URL we're talking about. This plugin. Well, I didn't necessarily need to go to my website for this. Just anybody's website. You go to Yoast and you go to the side panel and I think it says posts or something. And it's just, it just shows you a new method to look at keywords. It's uh, got a lot of hype on the internet right now. It's pretty, you know, it looks pretty um, interesting. I can I can open a admin of a site and you can show me if you want. Well, on somebody else's website, you mean? Yeah. We well, yeah, just go to the Yoast. Uh... Right. Okay. Hold on. I'm sure. Yeah, they partnered up Yoast and SEM Rush. Right, but it looks like it's probably really interesting. It's a fast way to get some new information. Um, I, I, I just remember, um, there's just a few steps is what I'm getting. It's just a few steps and I just wanted to go over those steps. Like if you just demo it, I, once I see it once, I usually can understand it. Um, I think that you don't have the article though that you referred to. Oh, it was just it, it was just a tweet, you know, like on Twitter, like Yoast is tweeting right. something. But you new. said that it it's all over the internet, and I just did a search for a new method to find keywords. <laughs> well, 
No, and, it, uh, it's new. It's a new thing in Yoast. That's what's new. It's a new feature in Yoast. And I don't, I don't think you need premium for some of this. That's why it's something we can all use if we're not buying premium. Um, I think what what did they say? They said go to I. They go you go to the I Yoast. Is this what they refer to as focus keywords? Um, well, first of all, are we in Yoast? Because you won't find it if we're not. We need to go just go to Yoast on someone's website. Yeah, well, I think that's what Dan's trying to anyone, do. Anyone, and if you go to any one of your websites. Yeah, you, but I'm seeing here Yoast, but it's not. Well, do you have it on your own website, Yoast? Yeah. It'll come, it should come up. If I recall, you go to posts, if I recall. Um, okay, it's down here, but what I see here. Go to add related key phrase. Over here. I, it may be actually the one above that says, uh, just scroll up a bit. Uh, get related key phrases. Maybe, because I don't know. Yes, I, I think, think you have to enter a, the focus keyword and then it'll spin off a okay. bunch of variants. Okay. Right, so. Okay. So this must be it. it. Yeah. Yep. MSCM Rush. So okay. you have to register. I don't know if you have to have a paid account or just register there. I don't I don't think you have to have a paid account for this the way they were talking about it. There it it offers many other features that you need the paid account, but I think there's a basic. I think there's a basic way you can do this. Okay, so maybe for next time you can show us a demo on your site with uh, if you have an SEM Rush uh, user. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm not on Sam. I'm not, I'm not on SEM Rush. No, I, yeah. I would just go to my Yoast. It should show up. It, it seems like from uh, just just reading online and stuff is that they did partner up and Yoast can access SEM Rush directly within the plugin. However, you do need a subscription, which is hundred dollars a month from um, SEM Rush in order to really uh, use it. Well, an SEM Rush, any one of us can get ten. We can you can put in ten words. This is a big secret that more people don't know about. You can put in ten words every day and get information on it and how other, you know, the, the uh, volume, search volume of the keyword, and, you know, get a lot. It's free. You can do that on SEMrush every day. Uh, ten, they stop you at 10 and then, then you're, you're out of the system. But so that's why I think this is probably something free. This new, new thing, I think it's what you just did probably to put in uh, an example. I think all you have to do is sign up with your email and your name, which we didn't do just now, I guess maybe they just, maybe it's just um, email lead generation. Maybe that's what SEMrush wants right now. It's just, I don't think, I don't think you're, you're not getting an account. I don't think that that's what that was. Um, okay. Well, anyway, so anyway, so I can, for, I mean, I can go into my own website and do it and play around with it and see what happens. I just thought it's just new. I thought maybe someone here has already tried it. Does anybody in the meetup uh, have uh, experience with uh, that connection between Yoast and uh, SEM Rush? Okay, so my next question, which um, should be pretty fast, is I mean, I do have a blog page, but we deactivated it because I was I don't have the time. I don't have the time to write posts for my blog, and I you know I I keep reading how important content is you know for everything for you know. Um, traffic and whatnot. So can you just, rip, I just, so because I don't do it very often, I forget what's the best way to, I like to find an article and then make comments on it. And so it's, it's, it's the method of putting it into your, of making a blog post and the URL of the, the person who wrote it, like, how do you share? because it's sharing on, there's different ways of sharing on social media, but what about just starting with blog? What's the best way to share an article and then put your commentary on it? Because 
I don't know if you can do that. I, I once was told you take it, you can take an excerpt from the article and you can, you can certainly, you need to put the URL, the URL of the writer of the, the fur of the media firm that's written this, this article that they have to be there. Um, but what is the method to just, you write your own content in the commentary about the article, but I still want to put in the article. In a blog. Well, the fir first step is is writing the article, right? You have to have content that you want to share. You first Wait a second, Dan. Dan. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure that I, that I understand what Fern is asking. Are are you Fern okay, talking you about you've written a blog post, <laughs> which is a commentary on someone else's blog post, and so your question is in regard to your post is what? Yeah, I want to show the article. Like, there's a lot of marketing. What does article. show mean? Oh, I want to post the actual. Um, yeah, but posting is not what you mean because posting is just clicking a button to publish your blog yeah, post. My, my, my. Let's my, keep uh, trying. So, what are you trying to? What do you want? You are you trying I want to, to write promote the blog blurb. post? I want to write a blurb about the article. Okay, like so a, you go ahead and you write it. Now what? You, you cannot, yeah, but you I want to also. I want to also attach the article. First of all, you have to show where you're getting it from. You have to show the source anyway. So. I don't think there's any have to's in this. If you want to, so you're saying, can I include a copy of the post that I'm commenting on? Is yes, and my comments, right. Uh, the blog will be my comments. It might be a three paragraphs long. Right, so you want it. to credit the, the original yes, writer. Yes, I want to credit them and- Okay, I so usually- it, it, would not be, it would not be normal for you yeah. to uh, copy the post in order to comment on it. The normal way to do this, and that's why we have this thing called linking, hyperlinking and such, is that you provide a link to the post on which you're commenting and you provide excerpts from the post specific to the comments you're making and you leave to the reader of your post the right. option to go to the post you're commenting on to see that post. but it, it would be one in a thousand to actually include the text of the post on which you're commenting. Well, this is where I, I, guys? I, I do a, I, I do a lot of posting on the Twitter or Facebook, whatever, LinkedIn, and I do share. I share right from the article. So I click on LinkedIn or whatever, it goes right to LinkedIn and it gives me a section where I can comment on the post. But I think it's harder to do in your own, I'd like to develop my own blog more. So yes, it's harder to do when it's your own blog. I want to, um, you're right, you have to provide the link. That's right, the link, the, the link for the article and you can talk about, you can use excerpts from it. But when you provide the link, I guess you're providing the whole article. That's where I'm confused. You're not providing just excerpts from the article. You mu the link must be the whole, the whole article. The well, link I, I, would be <laughs> to the post or page itself. Okay, I know what she's trying to do. Uh, okay. Okay, excuse me. Uh, what you, you can do, what you can do is, and, and they're right, by the way, with the links going back, definitely. Yeah. But you can copy like a sentence or two out of it and to start yours and say, and continue on and then with the link. So, but you can copy and post a couple of, uh, a sentence or two. Right, but the question is- um, The link has to be, as they said, the link has to go, there has to be a link with that it takes them to where you got it, yes. Yeah, right. and Fern, I think you can you can rest assured that the people who read your post will understand, perhaps better than you, that the URL represents the thing that you're commenting on. Right. And that therefore, they click that without you even having to tell them, hey, this is the article that I'm commenting on, so you can click this link to go and see the article. They'll understand that. But I do add one thing that I've just recently been reading about and uh, I'm considering incorporating for myself. Um, the problem that we often have when we refer to someone else, a text by somebody else by the URL is that that URL will, that link will break either for any one of a dozen different reasons. And so six months, a year, five years later, that link will not work. So I was reading a, a, somebody's post the other day who said, don't provide the link to the actual post or article. Provide the link to that same item in the Wayback Machine because that assures you that 25 years from now, that link will still be good. 
And so you say, okay, well, there's two problems there. One is convenience. That seems like a pain in the ass, number one. And number two, what if it just came out yesterday and it's not in the Wayback Machine? Well, the article that I'm referring to explains that, well, there are there's at least one and perhaps several Chrome extensions, which put a button on your browser, which when you're visiting a page, if you click it, it will give you the Wayback Machine link for that particular item. And I think it also will ask that that page be put in the web archive if it hasn't been already and then give you that link. That does seem at first glance a, a wee bit cumbersome, but it is an effective way to deal with something which we gen generically refer to as link rot as an ROT. Well, um, that's and if you Google well, link uh, rot, that's you'll that's see that there, this is a real issue that's in the honey. web as it, as it ages. Okay. That's highly technical for me, how that all that that thing you're talking about. So I, I would I personally for now would just keep an eye on the link to make sure it keeps live. It's continuous. If it's not live, I'll just I'll have to delete, I'll have to delete that blog post. So here's Alan, my question. Did you want, did you want to uh, say something, Alan? Can I inter can I interject here for a second? Yeah. If you don't mind. Okay. I just sent uh, info at um, whatever the email, a template of how to uh, uh, curate a post, uh, all the visual elements that are required. And uh, as, as uh, everyone said uh, already, uh, you, you can take excerpts of the article. You can yeah. have the head, you can have the title, you can make comments, you can have excerpts and then provide the link at the bottom of that, which is uh, best practices, but you can't really copy anybody else's article on your site. That would be plagiarism. And uh, that's not allowable until unless you have a no follow tag and you have the uh, you have a, uh, uh, a permission from the writer to do that. So I think the best way to do it is uh, uh, if uh, if you if someone can forward that that um, that uh, visual graphic that I sent you on how to curate a post uh, to Fern would be appreciated. Who did you send it to, Alan? Uh, I sent it to info at. Um, um, Alan, you can put it in the chat if you like. Yeah. Like. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how to do that, but. Um, Copy paste the URL of the image into the chat. Okay, uh, I have it's it's a JPEG on my uh, on my on my drive. Right. Do you it's see the URL. button that says file? Right, the chat. Okay, I'll okay, I'll try to find it and I'll send it to you. So um, yeah, that that link that uh, that that's very interesting, and you're mm -hmm. right. Um, you're right about that title, comments, excerpts, a link at the end. But you know, I, I guess what is when you're. I I also share on Twitter, link, LinkedIn, Facebook. I share the article right from the article. I, I I'm not getting permission when I share it right from the article, and then I make my comments on LinkedIn, for example. Um, it's easy, and and also the image, the image that they the image with the article goes along with it. So I basically just shared the whole article and the image with my comments, which is how I get known, right? My if, wisdom on something. So, but that, that's where I'm confused because I'm not, I'm not asking for permission, but yet I think you're right. I, I, I once talked to one of these companies um, the overseas where they, they, get, they, they saw something I did and there was a problem. And they, I, think, I think you do have to get permission. That's where I'm confused because that, that would be a lot of work for blogs to get permission from right, the but that's not, that, you don't need permission sharing on social media. You don't need permission to excerpt from any uh, written text. As long as you put the link in. I'm not even sure if you have to do that, but I, you know, it's considered good form yeah. and polite to cite uh, correctly wherever you got the source of whatever it is you're referring to. Well, um, but then, you know, but there's right. something referred to legally as fair commentary which provides an exception to trademark law or copyright law rather, that simply says that um, as long as what you're doing is commenting in real terms and not using the comments as a way to basically steal somebody else's copy, then right. you're safe. And obviously academics yeah. rely on this and, and bloggers and uh, <clears throat> you know newspaper reporters and so on. Yeah, and you can say, you know, here's an excerpt from the article, and, and you can put it in quotations. You can copy and paste a paragraph from the article, but maybe use quotations, and you can say, this is from the article, and I agree because, you know, so I, I, I guess that's it then. Um, um, 
but where I'm, where I'm confused is when you link, when you, at the end of your post, when you put the link in, isn't it going to show, if they open up the link, they're going to go to see the whole article. Is that not correct? The whole article. Yes, they're going to see the whole article. And okay, just to well then, clarify really quickly, Fern, is yeah, that yeah. on social media, you can share because nothing is indexed. So you're not really using their thing to promote your own thing. So nothing is indexed on Google. You're not getting any page authority, page ranking. If you put it on your own blog, you're getting page authority, page ranking through the, their written work. Okay, and and it will be indexed. It will be considered duplicated content and it will actually be negative to your own SEO if you did that, if they reported that. Well, as, as long as you do it right, you know, I have no problems emailing the, the company. May, may I share your, may I share your article in my blog? I mean, I can, you know, right. but when I go back to doing this, it's, I've got my blog page, you know, it's great, but I just, it's, in, it's not active yet because I don't have time. I may have to hire someone. Yeah, for, for, for if they give you makes, makes your questions difficult is you, you were used the word share just a moment ago. Oh, that you're sharing this post, this other yeah. person's post. Well, that, strictly speaking, is not what you're doing at all. Upload, you're either copying it. it or excerpting it or commenting yeah. on it. Yeah. Sharing is just this social media thing, yeah. getting it into Twitter, uh, Instagram, the Google index or whatever. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. as long as you're dealing with excerpts, um, then it'll be indexed like anything else in the normal way um, and wouldn't be considered duplicate content. Well, all right, let's continue. Uh... I think we exhausted the subject. <laughs> um, all right, so is Mo, Mo here? Hello guys, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you for organizing this uh, meetup. I'm super new to WordPress. Uh, I actually started like uh, two or three months ago. And I've got a website up and running, but my problem is that I would like to have this website in two um, languages. And the default language should be actually German, and I translated the whole thing to English too. But my problem is that, um, unfortunately, when I go, for example, to a specific page, let's say the FAQ page, and although I define the translation, um, for the page in the other language. Um, when I use, I can actually share my display too, if it's fine with you. Um, yeah, share the screen so we can see what you're talking about. Yeah. And if you can share the, the site, the back end, we can take a look. Okay. So you see it right now? Yeah. Okay. For example, let's say I'm right now on the um, support page. And this should be the default link, like the default link, which is uh, for the German language. And when I switch to English, um, nothing changes in the URL. Although I changed like the whole menu, everything, like I translated, um, I have two different menus for two different languages, but it's still this one doesn't work. Or for example, when I go to this um, account, yeah. and this is correct. It has to be in German, then I switch it to English. This one works, but um, it doesn't work on the uh, support page. Mm -hmm. And you're using WPML? Uh, I'm using the WPML, yeah. And, uh, okay, so can you go to the support page in German, the admin? Uh, yeah. The way uh, uh, WPML works is they, they create links between pages of the same, of, of two different languages. So the same support page can be in a few languages. Before you do that, uh, can I suggest yeah. going to appearances menus to see how you actually link the menus? Um, yeah, I can actually. Because if back. you linked it as hard URLs, it may not. That's probably one of the reasons versus linking to a page. Okay, this is the, the English one. <clears throat> I actually use one of it. Uh, which is the store account support. So the the reason that this one, for example, for the store is a custom link is that uh, we just have one single product and I wanted to, when people click on the store, they go directly to the uh, single product page. It looks like you linked it, right? So I guess Dan, continue, sorry. Sure. 
So yeah, so if you can go to the support page in German. Mm -hmm. No, in the in the admin. Ah, in the admin. Uh, let me see. So I have to go here. Let's go to German, and then I go to the support yeah. page. The support. Uh, yeah, just edit. Mm -hmm. So then I get this one. Uh, you're trying to edit a translate translation using the standard WordPress editor, but your site is configured. You use the Elementor as the builder. Yeah, but the, the language settings would be in this in this editor. I yeah. don't think it would be. So Edit anyway. Okay, edit anyway. Okay, so we're, we're, what we're looking for is the the WPML um, tools. A little. Their so area. it must be here then, I think. Uh, yeah. So language of this page is German and. Now I can't really see here, but wait, you see there, it says English and then translation. Um, little pencil, English and the, if you go down a bit. Here you mean, yeah? Yeah, so it's translation. Like that, mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the English page. Now you're editing the English page. So you built that page, uh, the German page with Elementor, right? That's true, yeah. Okay, so now click edit with Elementor. Mm -hmm. Now what we wanna do is change the language here to German. And the other issue is that I cannot see actually that button here on the site, um, like load the website on another page. Like, so this, this uh, language uh, switcher buttons uh, will be hidden actually in the Elementor. So I don't have any control on them right now. But, but when you show the site, like when you view the site uh, normally in the front end, you do see them. Exactly, yeah. Like this, for example. That may be okay. That that's another issue. But let's let's look at. Okay, so right now, if you, can you, if you click on uh, Dutch, Deutsch. Yeah. So, so it still I... loads the English page as if it's not defined that this is the let's say the German uh, yeah. translation of the English page or vice uh, versa. Can you go back to the editor where we edited the page? Sure. I think it was here for the support page, for example. This is the support page? Exactly. Where it says, so it says product on top? Uh, yeah, let's say the only change is here that it says product in German and the other one is with K. Just as an example, I didn't translate the whole thing. I just wanted to make sure that the links would work. Okay. So can you go click on the little hamburger menu on the top left mm -hmm. and go to the dashboard. And let's go to the Okay, can you click on update? Yes, here. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe now we can take a look.
I think it's best that you don't do the preview, but actually go to the site. Oh, okay. So let's say here. And then the support. I changed it. You see, this is the same issue, like. Still not going. Yeah. Uh... So when we go just to the home page, like the whole navigation, it, it works actually. Like here, I can I can change it. You know, it loads in uh, German. I can go to shop, account, support, whatsoever. Uh, the problem is like uh, when I switch to English. So here, actually, nothing happens. And the other way around too. Like when I'm in English and I click on German, like this link doesn't change at all. Yeah, it changes when I'm in, in account, for example. I click here. It changes, but it still goes to like my account number two, which is weird too. Uh, yeah, I see, I see what you mean. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe you can, can you uh, ask the participant, does anybody have a clue how to fix this? Well, if I could interject, um, I'm working on a bilingual site currently, mm -hmm. and we use uh, Google Translate to override the, all the French uh, copy. Um, but I'm not sure if that's something that uh, you would want to uh, investigate for your site. Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 has, it translates all the English for us. Uh, all the English is translated into French on the fly. And then we can then go in, uh, get a Google Translate account for, I think it's $8 a month. And you can then override any of the French uh, copy uh, whether it's a product or whether it's a web page. Uh, and I'm, I assume you can do that with multiple languages, but you need to get Google Translate to do all the translations for you. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that you consider or not, but uh, I, it's just my two cents worth here. Okay, okay. Yeah, and this I've, is I've got one too. So that is, I've had things happen to me like that before, like it should work, the other page works and it doesn't. I did, uh, I just redid the page. Mm. <laughs> I literally created a new page, the same page, the page should be, but I just created a new page because I couldn't find what was wrong. Very similar mm. to I this. tried that too, actually, but like, like I deleted all the pages that were created after I installed the um, uh, okay. uh, WPML because I was not able to link them together. Then I like, um, Install the old WPML again, and it started to create the uh, pages in the target language, let's say. Oh. And still, the language switcher uh, doesn't work. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I think okay, but the, the uh, suggestion with Google Translation, maybe that would be a nice one. Maybe uh, I would. Also, uh, one of the sponsors. Yeah of this meetup is a company uh, that I talked about in the beginning, Weglot. Mm -hmm. They do yeah. something like uh, Google Translate, but you know, it's, it's a paid product and it's supposed to be a very good one, which takes the headache out of these kind of uh, translation plugins. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. And I'm gonna um, check these two other options. Sure, thank you for, our, for posting. Thanks a lot. Okay, so let's see if we have any other. No. Okay, so we don't have any other requests on the meetup uh, comments. So I guess we can have um, an open conversation. If anyone has an issue that he wants to raise right now, uh, please do. Does it have to be about translating? No. 
<laughs> well, then I'll let somebody go first because mine's silly. I'll wait till the end. <laughs> Uh, I have a question. Uh, I have a question about optimization. Sure. I tried. I, I have a site I did. It's there's got a lot of content and large images. I was trying a couple of plugins um, to try to optimize, but I don't really see any difference. Um, could we take a look at the site and see if anybody has some suggestions? Sure. Can you? Can you share your screen and share the site's URL in the, in the chat? Sure. So I'm not very familiar with optimization. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's some sites that you can go to check speed. Right. So optimization um, touches a lot of a lot of points. It could be image optimization. It could be code. It can be server optimization. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of options out there. But I guess the lowest hanging hanging fruits are the image optimization because especially today you know if you shoot with uh with your phone or even if you take off uh, stock images you can take off an image which you know weighs five megabytes and when you have a few of them on your website it, it accumulates a lot of a lot of uh content that the browser needs to download which slows up your website very much so there are a few optimization plugins, but before going to the plugins, because the plugin can only do that much. But if you work with uh, either uh, photo editing um, uh, programs like Photoshop or, or similar, or you use websites which uh, reduce image sizes, that can do a lot of work for you. So for example, if you have an image on your site weighing you know, uh, five megabytes, um, you could process that image through Photoshop or similar software or one, or one of the uh, online tools. You know, if you search Google for image online image optimization, you'll get good results. Um, you can you can probably reduce that image from 5,000 kilobytes, which is five megas, to you know a few hundred. And if you have 10 images on your page that sums up to a lot. And that's very, I mean, relatively easy to do without even starting to look into caching and code optimization and, you know, all those getting to into that rabbit hole. So for example, if we look at uh, uh, your site, safss, right, .org? Yep. Uh, settlement and assistance. So I see you have a very, if you can, you know, show the, uh, uh, the front end of the site. There's a very big um, slider going on on the homepage. Yes. Um, and we have to check, you know, what, what the weight, how, how much these images weigh in order to, to know if, if, you know, we, we need to optimize them. So I see right now, uh, that these images, not too bad. I mean, the main image is 300 kilobytes, and then we have another one volunteer. The, the coffee cup is uh, something like uh, 200. So only in the top section, we have about 600 Ks. Um, on the home, the one with the virus is another <clears throat> 100. So all these images should be optimized. And once you optimize them, uh, I mean, that's, that's a very uh, big progress in optimizing the homepage. And then you would look down at the, uh, the other images you have there under services. And you would check uh, each image and see um, how much uh, they weigh. And then you would, you would bring them through uh, image optimization, either a website or, or software, and then upload them again into your site. 
Excuse that, me. Uh, is there a way to check the size of the photo um, without using the media library or? Yeah, I, I'll, let, me, let me share my screen and I'll show you what I do. I'll just uh, open the site first. Are these images that you're referring to, ones you have on your own system or your own local machine? Yes. Because are you on a Mac or Windows? Mac. If you uh, click on the file and then use the get info command, it'll open up a box. And one of the items in the box will be the size of the file and the image format and a bunch of other information. Dan, can you just open up a properties box on Windows? I'll, I'll show you even a better way on a website. So this is the website and we, we're using the uh, uh, Chrome inspector. So if I click here on inspect, I'll see here, this is a, a very important tool for, for working the website. But here in the network tab, if I click images and then I refresh the site, I can now see all of the images that are loaded on the homepage. So for example, I can see that this main image here weighs 310 kilobytes. And this one here, the home CTA, which is, uh, I don't know why it's not loading right now, but it did load earlier. The, the coffee cup weighs almost 800 kilobytes. Well, um, I don't think that's the coffee cup. I think that's the, um, the image with the kids, the woman on the bench with the kids. It's, it's a big image. Yeah, so the, the idea here that you can click here, oh, this is the coffee cup. Yeah. So this is, you can see here, 325. This is 110, which is okay. Um, so, so where should I be then? Because um, I don't want to lose the quality. Well, they're the, <clears throat> the you know, a, a golden line between the, the quality and and the way of the, the weight of the image and the dimensions of the image. So, um, for example, if if you look at um, this image here, the main, the people with with the hands, right? You see, this is the dimensions: two thousand by one hundred one thousand three hundred thirty-five. Do you see that? Yes. Yeah. So two thousand. I mean, even if people are, are looking at your website with a very big screen. Um, not sure they have a 2000 pixel resolution. And even if they do, and you, you use an image which is, uh, you know, 1500 or 1400 or 1600, still okay. as a background image, it will look good enough. So we could take this image, if we take the original image, put it through Photoshop or an online tool, and you, you will say, okay, make this image uh, proportionally resize it to 1600 by wh whichever number that be, let's say by 1000, and make the quality 70%, you might reach this image being weighing 150 kilobytes. Uh, can I can I just pop in here just one second? Because I started doing nothing. I'm just uh, <clears throat> websites when, a, when, know, when websites were yeah. like uh, yeah, go ahead. like HTML and we had, had to have little tiny things. And this artist told me back then that when to reduce my pictures, like exactly what you're saying, Dan. Okay. <clears throat> but What's go the down. Dan, can you mute yourself? You're you're talking and we can't listen. I'm sorry. No, Alan was speaking and I. Oh, well, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so what happened was uh, I'd have to take these big pictures and take them right down to little teeny tiny things. And what he told me was when I had to do that, instead What's of dropping it immediately, just like you said, like take it to that, you know, from 6,000 down to, don't do it all in one spot. Take it a bit by bit by bit. And for some reason, the pictures will maintain a little more quality. In, but if you drop it right down because it's graphics, you know, they sometimes may not may lose a little bit of that nice quality you've got. 
So what I do is I just take it down a little bit, little bit, little bit, save it, take it down a little more. And I end up with quality photos all the time. I haven't had a problem since, but I know it's an old fashioned way to do it, but hey, it works. And, <clears throat> and then, it, but it gets down to the size, like you said, dad, to get it down to a size that's reasonable and, and, and that, but it helps with the quality a little bit too. It may take a couple of minutes more, but hey. I think it's worth noting that <clears throat> uh, images that you may pick up from some place other than having shot them with your own camera may or may not have been optimized before being published uh, uh, in a post or article or whatever. Um, if they, even if they have been um, optimized, uh, usually you can compress them by another third to a half without any problem, whatever. And if the original image wasn't optimized uh, through compression, then you can get upwards of 75 to 85% with no change in the quality of the image at all um, for, for a WordPress blog's purposes. So um, I'm, I've done thousands of images now uh, and just routinely use the 80% setting for PNG and for JPEG. And I've, I've yet to come up with an image with artifacts in it from being over compressed. Okay. Yeah, I guess when I, I'd asked uh, before, I mean, told me you have um, uh, pictures of, of people, faces, usually you wouldn't want to compress too much, but images who are just, you know, landscape or just amorphic, you can, you can compress more. So try to find the best situation for, for each image. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had been, when I asked uh, around before, I had been told that um, for a hero image, that uh, 2000 uh, pixels wide was a good amount, but you, you guys seem to think that's too big. Well, I guess that person, you know, who told you that, I don't know he, if he cares about image, like what set of optimization, but if you have to take into account, you know, the speed of your site and which influences also, you know, you know ranking, SEO, et cetera, mm -hmm. and you can say, okay, for this image, which currently slows down my site, maybe by half a second, if I can reduce the size to half the size and with, without even, you know, users won't usually notice that much, that can help my site. Isn't 1800 the standard for um, desktop mm -hmm. images? Because it's not the, the size for the, the desktop itself. Well, well, so if you made it smaller, the, wouldn't you uh, strip the image? Not anymore, though. I mean, you know, I've got, my screen's 27 inches, so. No, right. So when you, have, when you have images, background images specifically, which, you know, use, you use as background, as the name suggests, um, you, can, you can have them smaller than the viewport, the web the browser will will make them larger but still you, you know they, they, they will look okay uh, i mean i wouldn't take a 500 pixel image and make it 2000 pixels wide but between 14 1500 to 2000 that's not much of a difference in terms of uh, you know optimization okay and anything else that you might suggest i know um, i don't have much control over the um, the servers um, the client has decided on a service provider. So I don't, there's nothing I can do there. But are you using a caching plugin? Uh, I did try one, yeah. Um, do you know if your host provides caching services that may already be operating? No, I don't know. Okay, I would check that first. Mm -hmm. Are you on cPanel for this site? Yes. Look there to see if there's caching services provided. They usually are. Uh, you can also choose a caching plugin, and there that's a very popular thing to do. So there are an incredible number of articles to to read from beginner to expert um, on what caching is, what the options are for plugins, um, things to watch out for, you know, things that you can stumble over, like you make a change in your site and it doesn't show up, and it's because the cache hasn't been refreshed, etc. You can also control the kind of caching that goes on, what's cached, how often it's refreshed, you know, so it can get fairly elaborate, but caching just in general is a good thing just to check up on. First at your host, then consider a plugin, depending on what your host says. 
I, I've installed WP fastest cache. I didn't yeah, know. I'm not familiar with that. Anybody have experience with that particular plugin? I mean, what are the popular ones? WP Rocket is a very popular one. I, I would say like uh, like Robin mentioned, first of all, talk to the hosting provider because they might have the caching installed already and then you wouldn't want a conflict on your end. Uh, and ask them if it would conflict if you install a caching plugin and then- Oh, Dan, just sorry, just to interrupt for one second. On the question of the host, quite a, a number of hosts, uh, certainly SiteGround was one of them, provide both their own caching service with a plugin for WordPress to help you manage it. And then they also offer a, 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 like a two click route to start using the content distribution network. The largest one, Cloud, I think it's Cloudflare, unless my brain's gone to sleep. Cloudflare, which is by far the largest on the planet and um, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. is often offered free uh, as a service through your host. But you can also get it directly for free um, simply by going to Cloudflare and applying, you know, and, and registering. Uh, sorry, Dan, back to you. Yeah, uh, so probably the hosting provider, the server, would be the best bottleneck to work at first. They, they're using HostGator. Okay, so you, you can check with them uh, what the caching options are. And then if they, they don't have any, uh like like uh, robin said you can go down to uh, uh go check out cloudflare which is a cdn a content delivery network what they do they actually take copies of your site and then serve them to the closest to where the user is closest to their servers so they don't really access even the hosting server uh which significantly can improve uh the, the site speed then uh, as a last resort I would uh, go and also uh, install a caching plugin uh, for, for WordPress, which again, there are tens if not hundreds of them. So you would have to investigate and see which is the best. I, I use WP Rocket, which is a, a caching plugin, which I find, find good, um, but there are lots of others which are not, I mean, not as uh, bad. Do you have to play, pay for WP Rocket? Yeah, WP Rocket is a, the premium plugin. You pay for it, um, but I think their li their license is you buy it. You know, you pay every year, but you can use it on unlimited number of sites. I think they also provide things in addition to just caching. I think there's a half a dozen services that make the price more reasonable than just paying that much for caching alone. So that's something to consider. the The thing that we could also talk about briefly, hopefully. Um, is that um, optimization um, can also refer to the um, something that's called page um, render blocking problems with a site. In other words, uh, when a page is loaded, uh, the nothing the page your browser window may be blank for a period of time until all of the requisite code that the page requires is loaded completely. And so if there's something in the code which is slow to load, it holds up the whole page. So there's this concept referred to as render blocking, meaning blocking the rendering of a page by something internal to the page that can cause problems. And there's a fair amount of writing done about this particular phenomenon because it's a, an ordinary one with every kind of website, not just WordPress, but all websites. Uh, so I will give you an article, a link to an article, which uh, I just happened to be reading <laughs> yesterday. Um, and it's called How to Eliminate Render Blocking Resources in WordPress. And it's from a very, one of the more reputable, you know, blog sites. Um, uh, actually, it's from a hosting provider and it's their Torque newsletter, which is quite good quality. Anyway, they recommend the Google service which everyone else recommends called page site, page speed insights to identify um, what's blocking the rendering of a page. And then they recommend um, two plugins, which I'll give you the names of in the chat window called auto prioritize and another one called async JavaScript. And what they purport to do, because I haven't tried them myself yet, 
is to move stuff around so that the things which are crucial for the page to render are put up in the head of the page at the beginning. And the things which could slow it down but aren't crucial to the page displaying initially are put at the end. And in that way, they say, <clears throat> you reduce the effect, uh, or at least reduce or eliminate the, those things which are render blocking. So um, I, I provide this <laughs> primarily because I've just recently been looking at this stuff to solve a problem. And so it sort of freshened my mind. And uh, I thought this was a good article, but I'll give you the link to it right now. And then- uh, and Those uh, two things that uh, Robin mentioned, the, uh, the async of JavaScript and move stuff from the header to footer, they're actually built in into WP Rocket. So another feature for, for that. I'm sorry, did you say that again, Dan? I, meant, I was writing something. Yeah, so th those two features, the, the async loading of, of assets- Right, you're right. I did see that that was the case. Uh, it's included in WP Rocket as a capability. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is that uh, when, you, when you check your site speed with the Google tool, you'll find out sometimes that actually Google services cause these render blocking issues. So for example, if you have Google Analytics or uh, a YouTube video on your page, that can actually cause uh, your, your page to load uh, uh, slowly because there are stuff that the YouTube uh, window needs and it won't let the page load until it gets what it needs. So those plugins can, can deal with it. And I know that uh, another thing that WordPress this last version 5.5, they've introduced something called lazy uh, load of images, which, which has been around quite a while on the web, but now it's built into WordPress. So another reason to update to the last version is what lazy load does, it loads images just when you scroll them into the viewport. So if you have a website, for example, a page with 10 images and three of them are in the first screen and seven are, are in, the, in the second scroll and each of those images weighs 100K, so it's 700K is waiting to be loaded. It's not loaded right away, but only when you start scrolling the page. And that significantly uh, uh, makes a faster loading uh, site. I have a question about the um, <clears throat> resource loading. Sorry? I have a question about resource loading. Yeah, yeah. Who, who's speaking? Uh, Fraser. Oh, hi, Fraser. Hey. Um, can you hear me? My video is like really delayed here. Yeah, we can hear you, but that's why I asked because I didn't see you speaking. Yeah, it's weird. Um, so I will uh, link my site here. Um, I'm running WP Rocket as well. And one of my issues is that some of the plugins I have installed, like um, Table of Contents Plus, they're being included in the critical CSS path when they're not even on that post. They may be on other posts, but I'm seeing resources loaded for them when they're not specifically on that post. So I'll put the link down in chat. Um, and let me see, I can maybe share my screen. So if I'm looking at my site here, I'll disable cache and refresh. Now there's no table of contents on this page, but if I look at this fifth CSS loaded here, um, it's the table of content. It's for the table of contents, but the table of contents isn't on this post. Um, and there's a bunch of other plugins too, like the contact forms isn't on this page. There could be other ones and they're really high up on, they're like on, uh, they're basically above the fold when they shouldn't be loaded. So I'm getting these extra resources that are being loaded, slowing down my first page load, um, but they don't actually need to be there. And I'm running WP Rocket and I've tried overriding the critical CSS path for a single page. That doesn't work. So I'm wondering if WP Rocket is the one 
generating this critical CSS path for some general page that has all plugins and then applying it to every single page across the board. Uh, I don't know. I think uh, you can, if I, if I remember, I, I read it, I can't remember where I read it, but I read an article uh, that through, I, I don't know how, how uh, um, tech savvy you are or you want to dive into, uh, for example, functions, PHP files and sort, but you could, you can actually DQ CSS for WordPress for specific plugins uh, based on a page that you're on. So for example, contact form, let's say you're using contact form seven, which includes your CSS, uh, it's CSS files for all the site. You can tell them don't include the CSS unless you're on the contact page. So. Okay, so that would solve it for contact page. Um, but what about all the other pages? Let's say table of contents, if I have it on five posts and there's another hundred posts that don't have it and it's still trying to load that table of contents CSS on every other page. Right, so I think, I'm not, I don't know if, if WP Rocket uh, can solve this issue, but what I, what I do know is there is, there is a coding solution saying, saying to the page, okay, check if you have this uh, short code or, or, or a call to the table of contents. If you do load the CSS, if you don't, don't load it. Okay, and you said it might be in functions. .php? Well, it's it's a it's a function that you would write into functions.php. But I would so you can Google search conditional loading of CSS or conditional loading of plugin CSS based on web page based on page, and you will you will see. I I just uh, a few a couple of weeks ago I, I I read an article about it uh, about implementing that. Uh, so. Yeah, you can, you can, for sure, there's a solution not to load a CSS depending on a page you're on. Okay, I was hoping it wasn't in functions, but I mean, if that's, if that'll work, it'll work, yeah. Okay, thanks. Sure, you're welcome. Yeah, I remember, Dan, some plugin that started out on GitHub and in the last year has moved into the repository and it allows you to specify what's loaded um, page by page, if you so wish. And so that may be a, a technique. I just can't remember what it was called. Um, uh, right. But it's in the category of um, optimization, you know, generically. Um, let me see if I'll make a note and see if I can turn that up. But the thing is, you don't want to manage it. You don't want to go each page and check, okay, what do I need here, what do I need here. You want it to be automatically meaning the, the page would check, okay, do I need to load a contact form? No, so I'm not gonna load the CSS. Yes, but it may be that you can just have to do something like to choose the category all and have it effect in that, in that regard. But I think by having more pinpoint control, in, in many cases that will be the, do the trick. In other cases, I think you might wanna do something that's site-wide, but I, so that's just something to take into account. Yeah. Um... Are you taking more questions for website help? Sure, we have till uh, 8.30. Okay, um, so I'm learning Elementor yeah. and um, I'm working on a mock-up site and uh, I'm trying to do the mobile part now and it's driving me crazy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I need to the club. <laughs> yeah, I have to figure out a better process for mobile optimizing because I just feel like I design it really nice on desktop but then once I go to mobile, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so it just looks terrible. And um, I'll just show you, I, I'm, more, I'm also using Astra theme. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll just uh, share a screen here. Yeah. I was also wondering about like um, mobile optimization tools. Like I check directly on my phone but um, like I'll check in Elementor at the same time and on my phone, but there's also like tools like this mobile test 
me. I don't know how good that is. Um, but yeah, here's um, here's the page, like just like that <clears throat> on desktop. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Yeah, I see it. Okay, and then I just I I don't know if it's an issue with the um, oops. I don't know if it's an issue with the element or if it's an issue with the theme. Because then I'll just, it'll literally just, the text will just disappear. So. Okay. So uh, a few things about uh, responsive websites, and then we can dive into Elementor. Uh, I, I'm sure you, you've heard of the phrase mobile first, uh, which, which started uh, like maybe 10 years ago with the responsive web design saying most of the users will be on mobile, most of the user will interact. So we have to de design for them, meaning we design for mobile and then we expand for desktop. And it's a, it's a whole philosophy, we won't get into it too much, but the idea behind it is saying, if we cut down the stuff, the fluff around, we'll essentially uh, uh, design what we need because with mobile, you don't have too much to play with, right? You need the UI, you need the content, you need the images, but that's it, you don't have too much. So it's a philosophy of designing saying, we'll design mobile first, just what we need, and then it'll be much easier to expand and go to desktop. So that's just like a little uh, uh, background. With Elementor, again, uh, I, I do it too. Um, you know, des you design for desktop and then you, you're very scared to look at it on the mobile or, you know, change the uh, uh, use. I, I'll show you, I use an, the inspector tool with Chrome, which is a bit easier than just resizing the whole window. Uh, but yeah, you fear the moment, what's going to happen to the menu, what's going to happen to my text, my images, how are they going to flow? <clears throat> so Elementor has uh, uh, pretty good tools. They're not like 100% there, but they have pretty good tools for um, manipulating uh, the mobile layout of your website. So if you, for example, edit this page with Elementor, I can show you how we can, we can look at the page and, 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 and modify it uh, so it'll look best uh, on mobile. So just click on edit with Elementor and we can, um, we can dive in. Okay, so you know that on the left-hand side on the bottom, you have that little screen icon. Right, and if you click on mobile, this is a mobile view of the site. Now, yeah, what we're seeing is is we have um, a very big. If, if we look at mobile, a very big uh, space under the first image. Now, uh, we we have to take a look. For example. On this image is, is a, a image module which sits inside a, a column. So we have to look at the properties of that column. So for example, you click on the little gray icon there. And then um, right here on the left-hand side, you see the little mobile icon. So this means now you're gonna manipulate uh, only the CSS for mobile, the responsive mobile view. Um, so if you click on advanced, just, just put in zero for margin and zero for padding. Okay, that didn't help. But we have to find what is causing this big space under, under the image. But it's not only the space, like nothing shows up. Like the, uh, there's literally like nothing. <laughs> yeah. So, what's the the URL of the site? Delta. I'll I'll, I'll post it. Yeah. Chat window. It's a subdomain. 
supernova sites dot com. Did you get it? Yeah. And it's the events page we were talking about, right? Yeah, just event. It's a blog post uh, layout. Oh, OK. All right, so. Yeah, I see each item is getting a lot, a lot of white space. So let's see where is that coming from. Um, Can you can you change the row gap over there? Okay. And column gap. Why is it not? Yeah, what I'm seeing that each item has like 16,000 pixel height, which is strange. Can you go to the advanced tab here? Mm -hmm. So, okay, we got that to zero. Um, uh, back to content. Columns one, post for today, image position, image ratio, image width. Mm. Can you change the skin just <clears throat> to, to see if that helps? The top, yeah. Yeah, that worked. Yeah, so there's a setting with the skin, uh, the, the classic skin, that I'm not sure. That's but strange. The, card, the card skin you can manipulate pretty much to, you know, to your liking. I mean, all these stuff you can turn on or off. Yeah. Um, Let's see how it affects the desktop. Right. It, it will affect desktop in a way. Yeah. But you can have it, I think you can, in desktop, see columns, you can have one. Yeah. But I mean, there, there is probably a, a like a, a setting in the, in the default skin that we tried to look at that's causing a very big space. I mean, stuff is loading, but it's like 15,000 pixels under. So it's an issue with with a classic skin, um, a setting with a classic skin that you know you might have made by mistake on on the 
Uh, Dan, would might this be a page, uh, thinking back to what somebody said, maybe it was Dale, where um, as an alternative to sort of being a detective to figure out what the problem was, she thought it would be faster to simply rebuild the page from scratch. And in a case like this, where the page doesn't look particularly complicated, um, as you add each element, you can check to see what's happening. And as soon as you add an element that produces that big white space, you know that that's the thing you have to target. Right, but this is a module, it's it's actually very easy to rebuild. You don't have to rebuild the page, you just have to delete this uh, post module and, and uh, uh, add a new one. But I'm right. not sure that would solve a problem because I don't know if the setting is within this uh, post module or maybe there's an external style sheet or whatever uh, causing this. What, what does uh, the inspector say about that space? Well, it says there's a big space, but... Yeah, but does it say how that's being produced? What What's creating well, the space? It's coming from the anchor tag, not the actual image. Yeah, the anchor, the, the article itself. Uh, the article is the actual thing, uh, the post, so the, the image, the, the title. The article itself is causing the... You mean uh, the text, the content text? No, no, the article, the, the, the whole blurb of article, which starts image, title, excerpt, link. Um, so, we, you know, you can, we, we, you can go in and check the, the default skin, the classic one and see, <clears throat> dig in and see what's causing, or you can go with, you know, the card skin, which I don't know if this is what you, per the design, um, how would I get to the classic uh, skin specifically? I figure it's just an issue with Elementor, right? Or did I do something? No, I think, you know, I wouldn't think it's an issue with Elementor because uh, <clears throat> it wouldn't be a bug unless, you know, uh, you, you should see you're using like the last version and stuff, but uh, I wouldn't suspect it's a bug with Elementor, but maybe with uh, with the setting that maybe you didn't even notice that you, you know, maybe did, did a sort of setting, but uh, now we, we, you know, we, we can't find it where, where it was set up. Oh, so you can change the settings of each skin. Well, if we, if you go back to classic, yeah, that's what we did in the beginning. We went to, for example, the advanced tab and we, we, we reset, you know, the margins to be zero. And, and right. then we went to the spacing between the articles. Right. Uh, because maybe I should check my other pages and see how maybe they're set to classic and see how I... Uh, well, it, it's here, the, the setting is a per page uh, basis. It's not like this setting doesn't influence other pages. It just influences the specific module you're, you're working on. Um, I, I don't know if there is... I would doubt it that there's a, like an external style sheet that someone did that would influence this change, but uh, I would look, look again into changing the skin back to the classic one and then going over all the, all the settings of, of classic. Okay. Um, but you can, you can, even if you go with, with classic, all these things can, I mean, you can, you can achieve the look and feel of classic by using the cards. The cards is a skin that just introduces more options than the classic. Okay, so you, yeah. You, I think you can remove good. options from the cards skin to achieve the classic look. So sometimes, you know, instead of, you know, trying to figure out, oh, this bug, uh, I'm fighting for three hours, I'll just work, work around it. Okay. I think that's referred to technically as a clutch. A clutch, yeah. A clutch. A clutch? Yes. An ugly fix that has no virtue other than the fact that it works. Well, it's not ugly. Well, I mean, anyway, let's not, maybe that's a philosophical point then. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, that can probably... You, I mean, if, if you go and, and try to fix it, you'll fix it. You'll find a solution. It's not something that, you know, it's not a, an elementary feature to space between these items 
like ten, 10 floors. Um, but uh, sometimes a solution, uh, like a different solution can, can be the solution. That's what I'm saying. Okay. All right. Um, so so, so, Dan, Dan, that so that's a question. That's not a theme. Uh, that's not a theme. It's just uh, your own builder, right? Well, the, 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 the builder works within the theme, but this is a oh. builder issue. It's not a, okay, I wouldn't, it doesn't look like a theme issue, no. No, because m m most themes today are automatically responsive. It just happens. Yeah. Elementor is automatically responsive too, but you can also tweak it. I don't have to use a theme. Yeah, I was trying not to use a theme as much as yeah, possible. Yeah, I'm just saying I've only, I've only used themes. I've only used themes a few times and never had this problem at all. You can, you can tweak it a bit yourself when, you know, when you're editing, but, but just, it does most of the work. The theme does most of the work in, 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 you know, in uh, responsive, making it responsive. It just happens automatically. So I think it can save you a lot of headaches too. And there's gorgeous themes out there, beautiful themes. Right. Then, when you use a theme, especially a, a heavily designed theme, it's it's sometimes can get a bit of a headache to change that to the design you want. And when you design yes. a site and you want to build it by your design, a page builder is a a, a good tool. So you you use a theme which is almost transparent, which has no uh, design in it per se. I like Astra, I like Generate Press or other themes like that, which are sort of like a framework. And then you introduce a page builder where you can actually do the design inside the page builder. Yes, and Dan, it's worth mentioning as well that uh, the, the, the major page builders all provide themes now, um, which are simple sort of skeleton themes that you can use to get started and then build your own site, so to speak, because Elementor in particular, but pay, but Beaver Builder as well, have now the ability to modify headers and footers and sidebars. So they have moved from page building, which is technically the content area only, to something larger, which we might call site building. Um, but the key is that they have either a simple theme, a basic theme rather, or starter theme. And, and there are what, a half a dozen, Dan, starter themes like underscores and uh, and so on that are just basic enough that you will not get into trouble customizing them because they don't give you enough things to go wrong with. And they don't have the heavy overhead that an Astra, for example, might have. Right, and uh, I, Elementor has a theme called Hello. I think that that's what they call their, their bare bones theme that has nothing in it and they expect you to build everything with Elementor. And uh, well, Astro is a good theme. It's, uh, you know, has a lot of features, but it's a good theme also to build your site from. Okay, um, any other uh, questions, remarks, requests? None? I guess I wanted to ask if you had any uh, ideas for mobile tools like checking for mobile as you're going? Like, do you directly check on your phone? Because I find within Elementor, it's not always accurate or Divi or... Right, right. So the for me, the best check is on a physical phone. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, of course, there are hundreds of models and, and types. But usually I would check on, a, on an Apple phone and on an Android phone. Uh, and also, usually when you, you want to check, the site should be hosted on, somewhere on the web, unless you have a connection, local host connection with your phone in the, in the same network. Um, I use, uh, for, the, for the first steps, I use uh, the Chrome uh, tools inspector, uh, which can, you know, can reduce the size of the screen without actually dragging the screen. Um, and then from there, um, there, there are, to say the truth, I've never used the, 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 these emulators, which you can, some of them are free, some of them are um, a paid service, uh, which they give you like hundreds of screens. And um, what the, the way they work or the, the way they say they work is actually you, you connect 
to a computer running the Android software or the iOS, and you see the actual screen, the output of the screen on that mobile device. Um, but for me, with my, with my experience, if I check with iOS, I check with Android, you know, that's 90, I wouldn't say 99, but probably 97% of the cases, it's okay. And for the end cases, you know, you can, you can deal with it. But. Yeah, and I, and I work with a landing page company called GetResponse for my email marketing. And it's the same thing. If there's a web page that I've just designed, like a, like a newsletter, for example, that goes out to leads, um, the best way is just email it to myself. I email the web page to myself and then I look at it on my iPhone. And if there's something that's not good, you just go back to your editor and then you, you um, can correct it. Right, right, but that's your iPhone. But your iPhone, let's say if it's an iPhone uh, 11, there's, a, there's iPhone 6 and, and 8 and, and 12. Yeah, well, and no, we, I, I, yeah, I check, it, I check it on my daughter's iPhone, which is the latest iPhone. Mine's an old iPhone. But sometimes I also have to check someone's Android just to get, to get a good idea. Yeah. But, but a fast way to see if there's any problem at all with it is just email it to yourself and look on your, your mobile. That'll Correct. tell you right away if there's any problem with it. Correct. It'll give you an idea. Absolutely. Give you an idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The question was, are there tools to use on your phone to monitor your site uh, from the phone? Um, that wasn't the question, right? Um, no, the question was how you can test your site on looking through phones. Right. I think I just need to buy an Android now. <laughs> they, they certainly are cheap ones. No, no, you don't need to buy. You need to, to persuade someone else to buy. You don't want an Android. Oh. <laughs> right, but but you still have to. But on my, on my thing with my landing page and stuff, I just I still have to go back to the editor for the for the mobile. I use the editor for the mobile to make the changes. I don't do the changes on the other version. I, I, I you know, it's got it's it's a big company. It's like you go right to the mobile version, then you do your editing there. So yeah, yeah so there's two, there's two like editors. Uh, two well, editors. You can edit the mobile and manipulate the mobile uh, display. But not on, the, not on the iPhone itself, you can't. No, you do it while you're designing your site. Yeah, your right, but you test it, like you're right, you test it by looking at your iPhone. Yeah. And if you, you know, you can double check on someone else's iPhone, if it's a newer iPhone, you can double check on somebody's Android, but, um, yeah, there's, so there's two editors there. So if, if, if she was asking what tools you, you have, that's the best way is the, you have to have an editor for the mobile within your own software, within your own website. I think it's also important to note that um, you wanna test the most recently released versions of a given device like the iPhone, in part because Apple's been very successful in getting people to trade up when the new phones come out. So a, a, yeah. a relatively high percentage of iPhone users are using current or recent phones. And then the other mm -hmm. point is that it's not so much that the device ages as it no longer gets updates to browser software. And so as a result, um, gradually the old phone with its old browser version loses more and more sites over time until it's essentially uh, worthless. Um, I've been monitoring <laughs> without intending to uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post, which I read on my iPad, my ancient iPad. Um, and its, it's um, last version was uh, iOS 9. And um, the mm -hmm. Times and the Washington Post are just about at the point now where they can't be viewed on a browser of that vintage. They literally, Washington Post homepage no longer displays at all. And um, even in the yeah. case of the Times with the subscription and everything else, it doesn't render properly uh, on that version. And nor does the app work, <laughs> which is just to compound the misery. So it's, not so it's not just the device, it's the most recent version working backwards towards the oldest version and picking a point at which you're not going to bother with those older versions because they would be very difficult to accommodate. 
Yeah, right. like I want to watch I want to watch podcasts now, and I can't do it. I have an older phone, iPhone, which is perfect, but it, it doesn't have the, the an operating system uh, that would allow me to watch podcasts, which is the new thing now. And I'd like to watch podcasts when I'm walking, but I can't. I have to literally buy a new iPhone now, even though my my iPhone is in perfect condition. Another example is the new app for COVID. If you you can you know upload the new app for COVID tells you whether you've been near someone that's got COVID. You have to have a higher operating system for that. So if you're on an older iPhone, which I am, I won't be able to get that app on my iPhone. So the, the people having older iPhones don't have COVID. You, you, need, you need a newer operating system. You have to buy- well, It's funny though, because really what is there from a technological point of view that for something like the COVID application, which is something that's much more important than just, hey, it's another phone app, um, that they would use technologies which the older phones can't accommodate. And when oh, you they think about it, there really is very little in the last five years that's of earth-shaking importance to add to a web app that's as simple as the COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID one, uh, which other than its Bluetooth technology, is a really relatively simple app. Yeah, yeah they missed out on that. They should have done the older. They designed it poorly. They they really didn't yeah. think through what they were doing because otherwise they would if, uh, they would get 90% yeah. of iPhone users rather than 40%. And it's going to cost them a lot more to fix that error. Right. Well, they probably have 500 million as a budget. Uh, <laughs> so they have a chance well, to do it four or five times over probably uh, at least. Speaking of building websites, um, I was reading recently that uh, uh, before the pandemic arrived in full force, a bunch of sort of digital natives got together in the States and offered their services as volunteers to county health boards to help them develop you know, data management and apps for the pandemic. And the, they reported some of the county health people being stunned and shocked that in two or three weeks, two or three people could knock together a website, a database application and a web app that all seemed to run beautifully and it was all done volunteers. Um, so just go to show when it's your own time you're spending, you can be very efficient sometimes. WordPress is run by volunteers too. Okay, do we have any more questions from the crowd? Let me double check the meetup page. Well, if nobody else has anything further, Dan, we can wrap up. We've had a good session, I think. Uh, covered a fair amount of ground there. Yeah. Some good, good notes in the uh, chat window, which I'll capture and um, put together in the post recapping the session. Um, just out of curiosity, do any of the, the, the guys still on this call, have you ever looked at the uh, post that does the recap Ever made use of that? Anyone? Well, I, I take screenshots of it as we're going along. Because there's some usually there's something I really need to I want there's a, a link I want to look at so fastest way is just I take screenshots there and I'll I might I might even print them out and then tomorrow I'll take a look at that URL. In the time it takes you to do the screenshot, <laughs> you might find the thing in question in the post. Yeah, Robin was mentioning uh, the, the WPToronto.com website which we have which we post. Uh, the summary and the actual video of the meetup on that website. So you can Why always bring one up, Dan, just to. Uh, sure. Because that makes it more tangible. Or I can do it if you want. No, I'm, I'm on it. The thing is, I wouldn't have time to go to go over a two hour, a two hour video. To it's not the video that I'm referring to. Oh. 
but uh, Robin annotates and, and gives time to uh, to the actual video. So this is the website, WP Toronto. And you can see here the, uh, the Fix Our Website recaps for the past month. So okay. pick the last one and open that up. Um, I post the URL for this post in the meetup comments for this session. And then you get the email that announces that the post has been published. So you get three ways to sort of find it. So the first thing that shows here is the video, which as Fern notes, uh, going through a two hour video to look for some individual point would probably be a waste of time. However, if you keep scrolling, mm -hmm. um, yeah. there's a little blurb on our sponsor. And then here are the notes, which I prepare from the session, which are organized by person. And then I do a list of the links that are mentioned that are of any consequence or worth noting. So they can be found just from the list of links. And then for each little mini session that we have, I provide notes and uh, yeah, if I get to it, some explanatory information, or maybe if it's something that I've recently worked on, then I'll throw in a few more links or explain something in further detail. And so I would say a quarter of the content at least is new material that you, that I've supplemented the, the topics that we've covered. Um, and then a part of it is also debugging things which were unclear during the session, but which I've had a chance to think about or to check on. So as you can see, if you know what you're looking for, like in Fern's case, I'm looking for this particular item that was in the session, you could just search the text and find it relatively quickly. Um, then there's the chat transcript, which is what you see in your own window in the Zoom session, but this is a the text of it just convert into HTML and provide it here. Um, I clean it up to make it more intelligible than it is when it's originally put together. Uh, and then I make the links clickable and all the rest of it. So that's uh, so what- for No more uh, screenshots. You just go to, the, to Robin's post. Uh, yeah, I could do that instead, right. You might find it better <laughs> than the screenshot. Well, if I only oh, want one one link, if I only need one link, like like the J Jeremy gave us something to do with Canon, uh, you know, some something to do with uh, the post question I have. That one thing about WordPress Canon, uh, forget I cut notes on it. Uh, um, was it in the chat window? Yeah, it was in the chat. Just one URL. He just he he gave me. He actually help me just get to give me a place to look and were you able were you able to understand what he was trying to say there because when i went through it i had to really think well, hard to make sense of it well no uh, i have to go to that link i have to go to that link that he no, left actually on the chat. if you don't understand what he says before the link you won't get anything out of the link he was talking about the can canonical URL without explaining that that only applies in the case yeah. of publishing somebody else's post or article with their permission. And then whether you provide commentary or not, it's not relevant right. to, to his point. Right. He's I saying in that. your meta tags, make yeah. the canonical URL, the URL of the post you're publishing, not the, not the URL of the post itself, if you understand the distinction. Uh, so oh. in that respect, that's yeah, an example that's of a chat item yeah. that in a 10 years, you wouldn't be able to figure out what he's referring to. But a few words added, yeah. <laughs> I hope, make it uh, useful. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not. I, I'm not sure about. I don't know if I'll have time to go to people for permission. I have to figure this out. No, that was never an issue. I mean, that, that was just some weird thought you got in your head. Nobody, when they're doing commentary on a blogger post, ever yeah. asks for permission. As such, as long it as you needed. credit. It, it, their name is on the link. I mean, you credit them. Here's here's the that story. Has I do with it. it has nothing to do with it. You are legally entitled to quote from a text if your purpose is to comment on it. Right. Cite properly. It's like, like what you said. No, I, I right. do not understand English, Fern. If you are mm -hmm. merely quoting to comment, mm -hmm. then it's considered polite, but not legally required 
to cite the author, the URL, whatever. Yeah, because you're not plagiarizing. You're it's a copyright question. Yeah. Therefore, you can, you are not, you are complying with copyright law. Right. As long as it's a, it's quote unquote, fair comment. One thing I forgot to mention is I like the images. <laughs> this is complicated. I like the images that they're using, and I like to bring over the image as well, like the image in the post. So so this not just bring the over post. and what? That's uh, copyright of the image that you're not allowed to do. That's well, if, it's a, that's if, it's a, if it's a free image, of course you can copy it. You'll never know right away. Well, yeah. you you can simply get the image, search on Google. Yeah. Uh, it'll tell you if it's copyright or not. Yeah. And off to the races if it has it. I mean, it's yeah. Eh, it's pretty accurate, pretty good at finding images and telling. Now, you when, when, when they, they come from. when they, the reader clicks on the link of the marketing uh, article, they'll see the image there. I think probably when they click on it. But I want the image in my post. You see, right. so so if it happens to be um, a free image, yeah. like it's yeah. from a public source. Yeah. Then. You're just as entitled to use it as the person from whom you're copying it. They just saved you the trouble of finding it. Now, it, I don't think it'd be considered particularly good form, right? Oh, oh boy. To copy well, somebody else's to... work and not credit them with it. But that's well, what we're talking funny. about is manners, not yeah. law. I know. Um, and often they, they create their own images too, because a lot of these people are marketing firms, media firms, and often they create their own images. You think so? Well, yeah, I found that. that I think often... at least 5% of them would be created for the post or article, maybe less. Or stock photos. They use those too. So yeah, how do I, mean, I the stock it? photos are in the trillions now, I think. What if it's not a Google image? How would I check whether it's free? It's not a question of being a Google image. Google will use the image to find that image or images very similar to it. And then you're going to simply look. And, and if you find an image used in five different sites uh you'll probably also turn up the source of the image and can click on that and go there and get it directly anyway enough said about that subject yeah very interesting all right i think it's 8 30. yep i think it's uh time to wrap up so thank you very much fern thank you thank robin you. thanks and to all thanks, those, everyone. Uh, all the members who are part of the meetup. See you next month. Ciao all. So